evening, everybody. I see a few people are still joining in. We may actually make it to 100 here shortly. Uh, this is Metro West Climate Solutions. Uh, and our talk tonight is about transforming your lawn. But first of all, a little bit about Metro West Climate Solutions. Our mission uh, has been to help build a healthy, sustainable, and equitable communities by hosting programs that encourage people to get involved in bringing about solutions. Uh, and to connect local organizations with similar missions in the area. And you can see in the right, a number of different organizations. Uh, and we've been doing this since 2019. We started uh, shortly before uh, COVID hit. And you can see we've run a number of programs since then uh, on climate related issues. Uh, these are all available, uh, or at least most of them are available on MetroWestClimateSolutions.org. You can watch all of these, and as I understand it, you get an honorary master's in computer in uh, environmental sciences if you watch all of these from First Parish. I think Jeff Barsnell is going to give you a handwritten certificate if you do watch all of these. Uh, but we have more coming. Uh, we already have in 2024 a few more interesting uh, programs in line. Uh, here's a list of them we have planned, and there may be additional ones as well. So if you want to get advance notice of these programs, we send out a monthly email with uh, information about these, as well as other programs that similar organizations are running in the area. So tonight, we have uh, Transforming Your Lawn to Save Our Ecosystem. And I, uh, it's, it's really my pleasure to, um, hold on, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, to uh, to introduce our topic tonight. So lawns, there are about 50 million acres of lawns in the US as I understand it, uh, the same as in all our national parks combined. Turf grass lawn covers more of the US than any other irrigated, irrigated crop. And we spend over $100 billion a year keeping our lawns a green monoculture. Lawns are resource heavy, requiring mowing, irrigation, fertilizer, and pesticides to thrive in New England. Transitioning your yard to incorporate diverse native vegetation helps to mitigate floods, heat waves, sea level rise, and the extinction of species that spend thousands of years evolving along with the native plants that we replaced. Well, we're fortunate this evening to have Mark Richardson, Director of Horticulture for New England Botanical Gardens at Tower Hill in Boylston as our speaker. He leads a team of horticultural staff and oversees a living plant collection that spans 16 distinct garden spaces, two conservatories, and over 100 acres of surrounding woodlands and wetlands. And while I have the mic here, I'd really like to put in a personal plug for Tower Hill. My wife and I have visited many times in very, every season. It's really a beautiful and inspirational place. And one could just visit it for the gift shop and cafeteria. As far as I'm concerned, it's one of the, the best west of 128. Well, Mark has, uh, has a passion for ecological horticulture and native plants. He came to Tower Hill from the Native Plant Trust, where he led the trust horticultural uh, research and development departments, uh, the Garden in the Woods in Framingham, and Asami Farm Native Plant Nursery in White Lake. He is co-author of the book, Native Plants for New England Gardens. So it's my pleasure to uh, hand the mic over to Mark Richardson. Mark. Thank you, Joel. And thank you to Metro West Climate Solutions for having me this evening. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, as Joel mentioned, I uh, worked previously at Garden in the Woods in Framingham. So I'm quite fond of the Metro West area. And uh, it's, it's great to be back, even if it is just virtually this evening um, to speak to you. And I am going to share my screen and pull up my presentation. All right, hoping everyone can see this okay. Yes, we can. There we go. All right, wonderful. So um, so thanks again for having me this evening. Um, so I, I've given this talk 
countless times and uh, always gets a pretty good reaction from folks. Um, and uh, uh, I, I know we ran with a different title this evening, but um, but really this is what I'm here to talk about uh, is is uh, is what one of my friends uh, likes to refer to as lawn murder. Um, and uh, you know, aside from um, uh, the obvious questions that that might bring up. Uh, what I'm really hoping to do this evening is uh, encourage you to think differently about your landscape. Um, and, you know, I like to start off with this slide because um, I think it's very difficult for us to envision where this picture might have been taken. Um, was this someplace in the Pacific Northwest? Is this in uh, Central Florida? Is this someplace in the Midwest? Um, there's just nothing that, uh, you know, jumps out at you to give you any kind of sense of the regional character uh, of the location for where this picture may have been taken. Uh, but for some reason, this has become the, the standard um, that many of us aspire to in our, in our landscapes. Um, and, you know, as an ecological horticulturist, as someone who spends a lot of time uh, very concerned with um, the environmental quality uh, impacts uh, from the work that I do, um, in my professional life and also my personal life, um, I want to run as far away from this type of landscape as I possibly can. Um, and hopefully by the end of this evening, uh, you'll understand why and you'll uh, you'll agree with me. Um, so first, I'd like to just um, spend a couple of minutes introducing myself and my background. Um, as Joel mentioned during uh, introduction, uh, I am the horticulture director for New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill. We are uh, about 200 acre botanic garden in central Massachusetts, um, just outside of Worcester in a town called Boylston. Um, and we have uh, tremendous natural resources. Um, we've got beautiful views across the Wachusett Reservoir to the Wachusett Mountain um, in the distance. Um, and uh, it's just a phenomenal spot. Uh, the formal gardens, um, uh, that really are, uh, surround the buildings um, are somewhere around 15 acres altogether. Um, and as Joel mentioned, uh, there's always something to do uh, and always something to see at the garden. We um, just last week wrapped up our annual orchid ex exhibition, uh, which welcomes tens of thousands of people to see um, 2,000 orchids uh, and more on display in our two conservatories. Um, but we also have a, a field of daffodils that's just now starting to bloom bloom, um, uh, thousands of bulbs all, th all across the garden, um, beautiful natural areas, beautiful hiking trails, lots of wetlands, lots of woodlands, uh, lots of meadows. Um, and I have a fantastic staff uh, that I work with to maintain um, the garden uh, uh, year round. We recently completed a capital um, project, which um, included the construction of a new um, family garden that we call the Ramble. Um, and last year we installed uh, our, our an update to our um, youth vegetable garden that we call the Climate Garden, which is really meant to interpret um, different uh, strategies for um, sequestering carbon in, in vegetable gardens in particular. Um, and so come and see us any time of the year. Uh, we're open year round, um, not 365 days. We do close on occasion, um, but we're definitely open year round and we'd love to love to see you there. Um, check out our website at nebg.org for more information about uh, what we have to offer. Um, prior to joining the staff at New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill, I was um, the horticulture director for the Native Plant Trust, um, which was previously known as New England Wildflower Society. Um, and while I worked uh, for the for the Native Plant Trust, I oversaw uh, the the organization's 45 acre um, botanic garden that's focused exclusively exclusively on plants that are native to New England, um, right right in uh, Framingham, um, as well as the uh, Nasami Native Plant Nursery out in Waitley, Mass. And Nasami is a very unique nursery. They grow exclusively native plants that have been grown from seed that has been wild collected. Um, and uh, that's really an effort to um, introduce more genetic diversity into uh, the built landscape. Um, and I was really pleased to be able to work uh, for the Native Plant Trust for the time that I did. Um, and uh, very, uh, very supportive of the organization's mission. Um, so that's a little bit about my recent background in horticulture. Um, but what I'm here to talk about this evening is um, my um, 
my disdain for the typical American landscape. Um, and I used to live in um, Maryland, pretty close to Washington, D.C., worked at a garden called Brookside Gardens, um, just, just north of the, of, uh, of, of the district, um, and uh, like to uh, and really enjoy the Washington Post. Um, and this was an editorial that was in the Washington Post back in 2015. Um, I had to uh, screen grab it because it just really kind of got to the core of how I feel about the typical American lawn. Um, and hopefully by the end of this evening, you'll, you'll agree with me. Um, so the, the article, uh, the headline was lawns are a soul crushing time suck and most of us would be better off without them. Um, and again, as in the first image that I showed you, the introductory slide, um, for some reason, this has become the norm. This has become what most Americans aspire to. Um, uh, you know, most suburban landscapes have a, a perfectly manicured lawn, or at least they aspire to have a perfectly manicured lawn. Um, and and a lot of us, you know, don't spend a ton of time on our lawns. Uh, we really, you know, uh, have them to serve as a, a green carpet outside of our landscape. Um, and it, to me, is, um, you know, not a not a reflection of nature, not a reflection of any natural system that I'm aware of. Um, and I find it, you know, relatively uh, drab and not not all that exciting. Um, but for whatever reason, this is this is what we aspire to. And I, th I think it has a lot to do with our uh, conquest over nature and, and the, the idea that, um, you know, we as as human beings are uh, are, are forcing our um, our opinions on aesthetics uh, on on the natural world and and um, you know we we look for uh, landscapes that look a little bit like this and I, I find this particularly boring um, there's not a whole lot of color save for a little bit of uh, you can see a little bit of uh, maybe some salvia um, there and that red um, and that's about it it's a you know there are different shades of green different colors of green set against this uh, this this uh, uh, you know white house uh, and that's for some reason this is what we're all shooting for um, our obsession with with lawns um, goes really deep and it's very expensive. Um, when I worked in the DC area, um, this is what the National Mall looked like. Um, and, you know, there are many reasons that the mall uh, looked like this. So um, uh, the mall is oftentimes referred to as America's backyard um, or America's front yard, depending on how you look at it. Um, but uh, the mall gets a lot of use. Um, so it's used frequently for protests, for concerts, for events. Um, and as you can tell, uh, lawn, a typical American lawn, can't really stand up to the foot traffic um, or the harsh conditions um, that exist on the National Mall. And so when I was there um, between 2009 and 2012, um, there was a lot of conversation about uh, trying to restore the National Mall. There were a lot of efforts to try to do so. Um, there was a, a lot of call for Congress to set aside funding for it. Um, and it eventually did happen. Um, uh, there's an organization called the Trust for the National Mall, um, and they led a restoration effort of the of the National Mall um, uh, back several years ago. Um, this restoration cost uh, almost a billion dollars, um, included restoration of about 20 acres of grass um, right there in uh, in Washington D.C. Um, it included the removal and replacement of all the soil and the subsoil uh, underneath the lawn. Um, and you know, one thing that I I was uh, was interested in learning about and uh, and and happy to learn about um, was that they did incorporate some sustainable practices in the restoration effort. Um, for example, they um, uh, it, uh, included a 250,000 gallon cistern, an underwater holding tank um, for basically absorbing, uh, collecting uh, rainwater, um, stormwater runoff that they could then use for irrigation. Um, they also uh, used a very um, sand heavy uh, mix of soil that's well draining that can tolerate more compaction more foot traffic um, and uh, they also installed um, drainage tiles underneath the entire expanse of the mall um, which allowed them to recollect uh, the the irrigation water that was put um, put on the top of the mall and go back into that cistern and sort of have, have a, a bit of a closed loop system um, unfortunately um, you know this massive effort um, that took place over the number of over a number of years um, left us uh, after some pretty substantial construction uh, with this. And again, um, seems like a lot of effort. Seems like a lot of money um, for not a whole lot of um, uh, return. Uh, this is a, a rather drab and boring landscape. It's rather sterile, um, and yet this is uh, this is what almost a billion dollars buys you. 
Um, and um, so what I hope to do this evening is to convince you that lawns are really killing the environment, um, that we could do a whole lot better uh, than the typical American lawn. Um, and I, I'm going to go uh, in some detail about what's uh, what's wrong with lawns, why lawns are a bad approach to uh, to uh, to landscapes. Um, and then I'll go through some steps that you can take at home um, to sustainably rid yourself of your lawn. Um, and then finally, um, uh, if I've convinced you that removing your lawn is a good thing, that you should really um, try to do that, <clears throat> I'll give you some advice on how to replace it in a sustainable way, um, particularly using native plant species. Um, first, I think it's important for us to set some ground rules. Um, so I, uh, I live in a suburban um, house in uh, uh, central Massachusetts. Um, my house sits on about an acre of land, um, and I have what a lot of people at first glance um, looking at my landscape would, would say is a lawn. Um, uh, that's true. And But I have three kids. Um, my kids like to play soccer. They like to play outdoors. I have a dog. Um, she really enjoys um, playing outside. Um, I think what's important about the way that we interact with the landscape is that we're thinking uh, very clearly and very consciously about how we treat that landscape, um, the steps that we take to, uh, to maintain it, the steps that we take to sustain it, um, and, um, and, you know, really, when I talk about a lawn, what I'm really railing against is um, the typical American lawn that receives a lot of inputs uh, and is quite damaging to the environment. So here's some ground rules. Um, first off, uh, a lawn is a monoculture of cool season turf grasses, most of which are native to Europe. Um, and I think that's a really important thing for folks to understand. Um, uh, you know, I remember first learning about Kentucky bluegrass uh, and being surprised that Kentucky bluegrass wasn't from Kentucky. Um, and, uh, you know, really, um, I think people just become accustomed to the plants around them, the plants in their environment um, as being native, as being all, as having always been there, as having evolved and adapted um, in a particular place if they think about these things at all. Um, and unfortunately, most of our um, cool season turf grasses come from a different part of the world where um, the climate is quite different. Soils are different. Rainfall patterns are different. Um, and as a result, uh, we really need to um, uh, put uh, turf grasses on life support in order for them to be happy here uh, in, in most of the United States. Um, lawns do offer uh, important um, uh, services. So for example, recreation space. Uh, lawns are able to withstand repeated foot traffic um, and can rebound from, uh, from moderate compaction. Um, that's why you know, a, a, a turf grass lawn is, is perfect for, um, for soccer, for, you know, for other recreational sports, um, but uh, not so great for a, a front yard or backyard or, or a garden. Um, there are, as Joel, Joel alluded to earlier, uh, millions of acres of lawn across the United States. Um, in fact, uh, it's estimated that uh, the typical American lawn um, across the country takes up almost 2% of the total acreage um, that's available to us in the, in the, in the, in the US. Um, and uh, the, the amount of money that's spent on lawn care um, is phenomenal. It's a ridiculous amount of money, $40 billion uh, estimated in a particular year. I probably need to update these numbers because these are pre-pandemic numbers and I'm sure that number is even higher. Um, we spend on lawn care um, about the same amount of money that the US um, sends in foreign aid in a particular year. Um, and why are, why are lawns such a bad thing? Why are we here this evening talking about killing them? Well, for a bunch of different reasons, but primarily I'm concerned with the environmental impacts and the human health impacts that lawns, uh, that lawns represent. Um, first off, uh, in the Northeast, lawns will always require irrigation. Um, my lawn at home uh, is full of weeds. Um, it's got, uh, you know, every weed on the face of the earth, every, every lawn weed you can think of, um, I'm happy to have in my lawn. Um, I've got lots of perennials that have sort of escaped my garden beds um, and made them made their home in their lawns. And I'm perfectly content with that. Um, that's less mowing for me to do, but, um, but, uh, um, and it, and, um, and I never irrigate my lawn. It's not a, it's not a practice that I would suggest people do um, because 
Uh, the only reason to irrigate um, your lawn is to keep it actively growing during a time period when it really doesn't want to be actively growing, and that's primarily summer. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons that lawns are not a great um, uh, uh, landscape treatment for us here in the U.S. is because at the very moment when most of us want to be outside and enjoying them is when they want to go dormant. Uh, the middle of summer when it's hot and dry in our climate um, is when the typical cool season turf grass wants to go dormant. Um, they go dormant in the summer because there aren't enough resources. There's not enough rainfall um, to keep them happy. It's, it's too hot for them to be happy. Um, and so we artificially prop them up by irrigating them straight through the summer. And that's, uh, that, that's very wasteful and uses up a lot of uh, water. Um, in the Northeast, about 30% of our treated potable water um, goes out on, uh, uh, on lawns as irrigation. And as you travel farther west in the country, as water resources become more and more scarce, that number climbs ever higher um, to the point where it's estimated that in some of the desert southwest um, states, about 60% of residential water usage is going out um, to irrigate um, turf grass lawns. And really that's only necessary because as I mentioned before, turf grasses are not adapted to uh, the climate in which we're trying to grow them. Um, pesticides. So perfection requires pesticides. Um, I would never apply an herbicide to my lawn at home. Uh, I would never apply a fungicide or an insecticide um, because I know that my dog is going to be out there, you know, chewing on the grass. I know that my six-year-old daughter is going to be out um, playing with her friend from across the street um, in the grass, and I don't want to do anything that's going to negatively impact their health. Um, and so I'm really careful uh, about um, uh, using pesticides around my home. Um, Unfortunately, we've become very accustomed to those little yellow cards that uh, the the um, uh, the lawn maintenance person sticks in the corner of our uh, of our lawn to let us know that they've they've treated it with some some pesticide or another. Um, I doubt very much that many people who hire a, a pest or a, a lawn service company are bothering to look at that uh, card to see what pesticides were applied, uh, when it's safe to walk on that lawn again, um, because it's just part of the uh, landscape vernacular. It's something that we just tend to ignore. Um, and in this country, we apply about 30,000 30, tons of pesticides annually. Um, in fact, from an agricultural standpoint, um, the agricultural crop that receives uh, the most or the highest amount of pesticides is sweet corn. Um, sweet corn requires a lot of pesticides because it's very susceptible to uh, European corn borer in particular. Um, we apply about twice to three times as much um, pesticide on turf grass lawns than we do on sweet corn, the, the, uh, the agricultural crop that receives the most pesticides in this country. Um, that's really disturbing when you think about how we're interacting with our landscapes, how we're interacting with uh, uh, the land around our, our homes and in our gardens, uh, because they're really toxic. Um, again, this is only necessary because turf grasses are not adapted to our climate. Um, and I know that oftentimes people are just, um, you know, quick to point out that uh, pesticides are really targeting um, uh, specific pest problems. Um, however, if you look at the health effects of uh, commonly used lawn pesticides, things like 2,4-D, which is an herbicide, um, or some of the other uh, products that you see on this list here, um, these are chemicals, uh, they're not benign. They have um, environmental impacts, but they also have human health impacts. Um, they uh, cause liver damage, they're uh, neurotoxins, um, they cause reproductive effects, they're endocrine disruptors. Um, most of them are at least uh, irritants to our skin. Um, they can cause birth defects. Uh, these are not safe products to be around. Um, and they're certainly not safe products for, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, the most susceptible, or the, or the, um, uh, excuse me, the, the, you know, the children uh, to be around, and, and unfortunately, a lot of kids come into contact with these uh, common lawn pesticides because uh, they, they're, they're the ones out playing in the, in the grass. Um, uh, lawns also require a lot of fertilizers, um, so uh, you know, having that pristine. Um, turf grass lawn, it's always necessary to apply some fertilizer um, because they're very resource dependent. Um, lawns uh, require a lot of nitrogen, uh, require phosphorus, potassium, and a whole host of micronutrients. Um, in the Northeast, lawns will always need fertilizer. There's just no getting around it. Um, 
And uh, in, in the US, we apply about 3 million tons of fertilizer um, to lawns alone. Um, out of about 21 million tons of fertilizer we, uh, we use as a country. That's all the agriculture, all the, uh, all, all the uses of fertilizer that you can think of, um, 3 million of those 20 mil 21 million tons are, are, uh, are put out on lawns. Um, there are newer fertilizer regulations in most New England states. Um, unfortunately, most people are paying very little attention to them. Um, uh, you're, in order to apply any fertilizers on a lawn in Massachusetts, for example, you have to have a, um, uh, an up-to-date uh, soil test. Uh, you've got to have a soil test before you can apply fertilizer. In Massachusetts in particular, you can't apply phosphorus-based fertilizers unless that soil test indicates that you actually need phosphorus. Um, so these newer regulations are attempting to limit um, the impacts of uh, fertilizer, um, but uh, unfortunately too many of us just completely ignore them because it's so easy to grab um, a bag uh, that has the four steps program on it um, and just paint by numbers follow the directions and um, we've got a perfect lawn. Um, and one thing about our soils uh, here in New England is um, uh, we generally speaking have fairly acid soils um, and acid soils don't really work particularly well with um, uh, cool season turf grasses. Um, the pH of our soils is oftentimes way too low. Um, so we you know, uh, apply lime and other, other, uh, other products to raise the pH um, to make it more conducive to, uh, to, to growing turf grass lawns. Um, and again, I sound like a broken record, but fertilizer use in lawns is only necessary because these turf grasses are not adapted to our climate. This is just a, uh, a clip from um, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources about um, the fertilizer law that was passed, I believe, in 2013. So it's uh, you know about 10 years old. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I'm sure many of you are uh, not even familiar um, with the fact that we have a, a, a plant nutrient uh, regulation in the state of Massachusetts. Um, uh, one of the primary uh, reasons that lawns are really killing us uh, is their impact on uh, global climate change. Um, so um, we, we spew a lot of emissions in maintaining our lawns. Um, so just a couple of uh, quick statistics here. Um, the typical lawnmower running for about an hour is the equivalent of about a, uh, driving about 100 miles in a car. Um, and when we think about how long many of us hold on to our lawnmowers, um, I'd say that number is probably higher on a dirtier, older lawnmower. Um, we're just, you know, resistant to replace that, uh, that expensive uh, piece of equipment that we use to maintain our lawn. Um, but keep in mind that we're also breathing in all those toxic fumes as we're, uh, you know, pushing that mower around and, and uh, taking care of that lawn. And if it's not us, it's the uh, lawn service company employee who we've hired to uh, maintain our lawn. Um, but all those emissions that are just being spewed into the atmosphere uh, have a tremendous impact on uh, global climate change. Um, and just to put one more thing in perspective, um, so I remember uh, it's one, you know, one of my earlier memories, I guess, at this point, um, the Exxon Valdez oil spill off the coast of Alaska that spilled almost 11 million gallons of oil um, uh, into the into the uh, into the ocean. That was a you know a huge environmental catastrophe, um, and uh, that was um, fewer million gallons of oil. Um, uh, then we spill in gas every single year, just filling up our uh, landscape uh, equipment. Um, so every time you go and fill that uh, that you know that that red uh, gas can at the gas station, you spill a little bit of fuel. Sometimes you knock it over accidentally. Uh, that's a lot of fuel spilled uh, over time. And um, in the typical year, uh, homeowners are spilling about 17 million gallons of gas um, every year, just trying to refill their equipment. Fortunately, there's been a lot of great development um, in this particular part of uh, lawn service over the last several years. Um, at New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill in 2022, uh, we were recognized as the first green zone certified botanic garden in the country because of our adoption of uh, electric power equipment for maintaining our uh, landscapes. Um, on the picture on the right here is our mean green mower. Um, it's a 48 inch um, uh, mower 
software that we use to maintain most of our uh, lawns at uh, NEBG. We also have a couple of uh, smaller, uh, more residential uh, homeowner scale um, uh, electric mowers that we use for smaller lawns. Um, but we're fully electric. All of our uh, landscape equipment is electric. Um, and I know a number of landscape companies in the area are um, uh, starting to convert their clients over to um, using auto mowers, like the one pictured on the left. Um, Great, great thing about an auto mower, much like the Roomba that you might have uh, running around vacuuming your house every day, um, is that the auto mower just does its thing, runs when it wants to. It can run at two o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon, um, and it mows every single day. Um, and if, especially if you have solar, um, you're mowing your lawn completely with renewable energy, uh, which I think is a fantastic thing. So a lot of great innovation in electric power equipment um, over the last several years, and that's just gonna continue to get better and better and better. Um, and we certainly at uh, the Botanic Garden are early adopters of electric power equipment and couldn't be happier um, because of the environmental impacts, because of the ease of use, um, because of the, um, uh, uh, the impact on um, our own health uh, and wellness. It's, it's great to be able to run a piece of power equipment like that without um, spewing fossil fuels that we're then breathing in directly. So we're, we're, we're really happy with electric power equipment and think it has a great um, potential for climate impact. Um, and then finally, I, I, I like to put this slide out there just for people to think a little bit more about um, the way uh, that we manage uh, many of our uh, landscapes. Um, I'm sure most of you uh, on the webinar this evening are familiar with the term invasive species. Um, An invasive species, according to NRCS, um, a plant species in particular is one that's both non-native, um, able to establish on many sites, grow quickly, and spread to the point of disrupting plant communities or ecosystems. Um, and the second definition there from a presidential executive order during the Obama administration, again, echoes the same thought, uh, non-native species um, to the ecosystem under consideration whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Now, I don't know about most of you, but um, I know that I work pretty hard to control invasive species at the Botanic Garden, work pretty hard to control invasive species at home. Um, I understand the environmental impacts, the economic impacts of invasive species. Um, and unfortunately, I think the typical American lawn um, is much more disruptive than the typical invasive species. Um, and the way in which we manage these landscapes um, causes economic and or environmental harm um, and certainly disrupts or occupies space that could otherwise be taken up by native plant ecosystems. So I think it's important that we think uh, about, you know, sort of changing the mindset that we have um, to the typical American lawn and think about it more in line with the way that we uh, consider invasive species. And finally, um, and I've said this a couple of times before, I just find this type of landscape particularly boring and very sterile. Um, you will not find a flowering plant in the acres and acres of lawn in front of the house um, uh, to the right, uh, which means you also won't find many bees, you won't find any butterflies, um, you'll find very few insects, very few birds. Um, this habitat, uh, this landscape is providing uh, next to no habitat for, uh, for anything, um, least of all ourselves. Uh, the last place I want to be on a hot summer day uh, is in the middle of that lawn um, where I'm going to get burned by the sun uh, unless I'm under the cover of a tent uh, or running through a sprinkler. Um, that's the only way that you would find me um, out in that out in that lawn, and I think that's really unfortunate. Um, this is a barren wasteland, um, and I think we can do a whole lot better. So, hopefully, I've convinced you that uh, there's there's a, a problem in the way we manage our landscapes, and, the, and, it, and it revolves around the typical American lawn. Um, and so now, I'd like to give you some tools for um, how to rid yourself of your lawn. Um, we're going to cover a few different techniques. Um, what I'd like to point out is that each of these has strengths and weaknesses, um, uh, and each of them has um, uh, some environmental impact. Uh, and so we'll we'll talk about that as we go through the go through the list. Um, so first is solarization, uh, and this is simply harnessing the power of the sun um, to essentially steam pasteurize um, uh, a landscape. Um, and the image that you see here 
Um, this was a project that we undertook at uh, Garden in the Woods. This was not a lawn, but we were trying to use solarization to control some per particularly uh, difficult invasive species um, and some pernicious weeds that we were really just trying to get a handle on. Um, but the technique is the same. Um, solarization is best done with clear plastic, as you can see here, really harnessing the, uh, the power of the greenhouse effect. Um, it's important with a lawn that you mow it and water it beforehand before uh, covering it in plastic um, because you, you really want a moist environment for, uh, uh, for ample amounts of steam. It's, it's steam that's really doing the, uh, the dirty work here. Um, it's important to create a tight seal around that plastic, uh, around the edges of the plastic. Um, and using this technique in the middle of the summer in a, in a sunny uh, location, um, it takes about six weeks to effectively kill off turf grass underneath that um, sheet of plastic. Definitely a, a great way to meet your neighbors, um, a great way to get them intrigued and interested in what you're doing, um, and a very effective way to, uh, to kill off a, a turf grass lawn, although perhaps not the most attractive way to kill off a turf grass lawn. Um, another option for uh, for removing lawn from from your landscape is mechanical remover uh, removal. There's lots of different ways to do this. Um, I know most local hardware stores will rent a sod cutter. Um, a sod cutter is a, a really great tool that will just go along and um, and cut just below the crown um, of uh, of turf grass lawn. Um, and you can then take that material and throw it into a compost bin. Um, uh, it's a it's a great way to remove a lawn very quickly, um, but it requires some fossil fuel burning and requires a, a bit of hard work. Um, you can also do mechanical removal um, just with typical garden tools. Um, it's very important that you remove the crown, um, that you get just below the crown so that you're removing the active um, growing portion of, uh, of the lawn um, and understand that that disturbance that you're causing um, is going to lead to some weed seed germination um, and also a little bit of soil loss. Um, with mechanical removal, you're left with uh, a blank slate uh, that really needs to be acted on very quickly um, so that you can avoid uh, uh, erosion of the soil that's there. Um, and oftentimes, um, a lawn that's been treated, been fertilized, been, um, uh, been irrigated, um, and, uh, and been treated with pesticides um, will require some uh, element of uh, sort of rebuilding of the soil organic matter. Um, so with mechanical removal, it's important to um, spread an organic mulch um, or spread compost immediately after the lawn um, has been removed uh, to start the important work of, uh, of uh, improving the soil that's left behind. Um, and then there's chemical removal. Now, chemical removal uh, is a very effective way to remove a lawn. Um, oftentimes, you can do so with a single application of a broad-spectrum herbicide. Um, I know there's oftentimes a lot of uh, conversation around herbicides um, and their potential harm um, uh, in terms of environmental quality and also for uh, human health. Um, but I, I give you a note of caution. Um, there are a number of uh, organic herbicides on the market. Um, one that I have some experience with is acetic acid, uh, which is uh, really highly concentrated vinegar, um, uh, more or less. Um, and it's, uh, it's sold in different concentrations, some of which you have to have a pesticide applicator's license to be able to purchase. Um, it is an organic product, as is clove oil, the other, uh, the other product here. Um, unfortunately, just because it's organic does not mean that it's safe. Um, and so with clove oil, um, this is a known carcinogen. It's something you want to be very careful working around and make sure that you've got appropriate PPE or personal protective equipment um, uh, while you're working with it. Um, and with acetic acid, um, it has a lower lethal dose uh, than glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup uh, that many of you are probably familiar with. Um, so acetic acid can be toxic. Um, it can also cause uh, 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 abrasions or, or burns on the skin. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a highly powerful material, but it is quite effective um, as an herbicide. Um, so if you, if you choose to go the chemical route, um, keep in mind that you should uh, you should try to grab a broad spectrum herbicide, one that's going to kill both uh, monocots like lawns and uh, dicots, uh, things uh, like the typical lawn weeds that you might expect to see, things like dandelions, for example. Um, um, and then, uh, and if you grab an 
organic herbicide, um, just keep in mind that organic doesn't always mean safe uh, and that there are a lot of human health impacts from using an organic herbicide, uh, just, just like the uh, synthetic herbicides uh, as well. Um, Another technique, and this is probably one of my favorite techniques for uh, converting a lawn to, um, uh, to a, a healthier landscape type, um, is uh, uh, either smothering or sheet mulching. Um, there's a couple different ways to go about this. Um, you can use a landscape fabric. Um, so lay out a, a sheet of landscape fabric over a lawn. Expect that to take some time. Um, this is uh, not as quick or effective as um, solarization, but it will work over time. Um, or you can go the more organic route um, and, uh, and use a technique called sheet mulching or lasagna mulching, um, where you put on top of the lawn um, either a thick layer of cardboard or preferably um, a paper product uh, called Ramboard. Um, Ramboard might be a, um, a product name as a, uh, sorry, a brand name as opposed to a product name. Um, but if you ask for Ramboard, it's really a flooring underlayment or a flooring protectant. Um, comes in, in large rolls. It's very easy to roll out uh, across the lawn. Um, and then layer um, compost, mulch, uh, whatever, whatever you'd like to on top, organic materials on top. Um, this is a very slow method for killing a lawn, um, but it requires very little work. Um, uh, once it's, um, once the, the ram board or the cardboard is in place, um, and it really helps to build healthy soils. Um, and I've seen plenty of folks who've gone about, um, killing a lawn in a weekend, uh, where they've, uh, planted some shrubs, are some trees uh, in the middle of an existing lawn, um, surrounded the whole thing with, with ram board or cardboard, um, buried it in mulch or compost, and then walked away. Uh, and, uh, and it's a great way to uh, sort of build an instant landscape um, and start to rebuild the uh, soil organic matter, as I mentioned before. Um, and then my second favorite method for uh, lawn removal is just stop caring for it, uh, benign neglect, just stop mowing and let it go. Um, and, you know, it's amazing what you'll find. Um, there's actually a, a study that was done um, in Springfield, Mass, a few years ago by the uh, U.S. Forest Service um, that uh, compared different uh, mowing uh, uh, intervals uh, in the typical um, urban landscape. Um, they uh, convinced uh, a bunch of folks to allow them to mow their lawns for the summer. Um, and some lawns they mowed every week, some lawns they mowed every two weeks, and some lawns they mowed every three weeks. Um, and what they found through their research was um, those lawns that were mowed once a week had very little insect diversity, very few bees, very few butterflies, really just uh, nothing because there were no flowering plants um, because the lawn was uh, mowed every single week. And so all the, uh, the weed, weeds that may have been there that may have had some flowers on them were cut back uh, every single week. Um, the two week interval, uh, uh, supported a, a huge range of uh, diversity of insects, uh, lots of bees, lots of butterflies, um, because those weeds were allowed to, uh, to flower, um, which attracts uh, insects. Um, and uh, so, you know, that technique of just mowing every other week uh, was enough to really see a tremendous increase in the amount of insect diversity. Um, and I think everyone uh, should know at this point that um, if you like songbirds, if you like birds in your uh, environment, um, the best way to support birds is by having a healthy population of insects in your landscape. Um, so that was really a, a, a you know eye-opening for me to understand that just uh, um, sort of spacing that interval of mowing out was enough to really support a diversity of insects. Um, so uh, if you have a lawn, you're, you know, you're not interested in mowing it any longer, you'd like a little bit more diversity, um, just stop. Uh, plant some perennial plugs, sow some perennial seed, um, and uh, try to get a little bit more diversity in there, um, and just have a nice meadow. Um, I think for uh, for for my uh, for my neighborhood, my neighbors would appreciate maybe a mowed edge around a meadow, um, so they know I haven't just stopped mowing and forgotten my uh, civic duty to uh, keep my landscape maintained, uh, but I'm actively maintaining the landscape in this way. Um, and, uh, and, and trying to encourage a more diverse landscape. But it is a very easy way to convert a lawn into another uh, landscape application. Um, so by this time, 
you you're you're probably thinking i don't i don't know what to do next my lawn's gone and i'm, I'm not sure what to do in its place uh, it's easy to follow the directions and keep my lawn going, but uh, I'm not sure what to do if I'm if I'm not maintaining a lawn in my in my front yard or my backyard. Um, so first, it's important to understand what your garden has to offer um, before you start introducing new plants into your landscape. Um, and what your garden has to offer plants is a combination of environmental characteristics from the soil that's there, uh, from the amount of moisture um, that you expect to see, and how much moisture is uh, is retained by the soil that you have, um, and then how much sun or how much shade you have in your landscapes. Um, really important for people to understand that um, plants have different needs, plants have um, you know, uh, 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 different cultural requirements, um, mainly based on how they evolved and what, uh, what types of uh, environments or plant communities they grow in. Um, and it's important to match the cultural properties of your particular site to the cultural needs of the plants that you're trying to add to your garden. Um, and um, rather than uh, repeating uh, the mistake of having a lawn that needs a lot of inputs, um, find plants that will thrive in your garden without inputs once they're established. And for a lot of us, that's going to be native plants. Uh, native plant species are, are those that have evolved in our in a particular region. Um, they have evolved to um, uh, to deal with the uh, environmental conditions that are uh, that are present in a particular area, um, and um, and uh, they're more you know they're better suited to uh, to the environment in which uh, you're trying to grow them. Um, for our purposes, native plants are those that existed in uh, New England without human introduction. So if you uh, can think about um, you know plants that are pre-colonial, pre-European settlers, um, plants that naturally migrated moved into our region, um, co-evolved with insects and wildlife. Um, those are the plants that we're particularly after. Um, and why should we be using them? Well, first off, as I've mentioned, uh, when native plants are properly sited, they shouldn't really need um, fertilizer, irrigation, much input from you, aside from maybe an occasional cutback and, and, uh, and a little bit of deadheading every now and again. Um, Native plants provide critical habitat for native pollinators and for wildlife. Um, I think the, the typical example of that is the monarch butterfly. Um, if you like monarchs, you've got to have milkweed. Without milkweeds, you won't have monarchs. Um, and so it's very easy for people to understand that. There are lots of specialists. There are lots of generalist insects. Um, and there are lots of birds that rely on those insects. Um, so uh, we always have to make sure that we're providing host plants um, in order to support the, uh, the wildlife, the insects that we want to see in our gardens. Um, Native plants help to establish a unique sense of place. If you go back to the very first image that I showed in the uh, presentation, um, it is true. It, you have no idea where that picture was taken uh, because you've got a couple of trees, some lawn, a little bit of mulch uh, uh, in a bed that's devoid of any plant material um, and no, no real indicator as to where you are in the world. Um, but you know, here in New England, um, I think most of us recognize that you know uh, maples and oaks and things like blueberries um, have great fall color they turn brilliant in the fall um, and that really helps to establish that uniqueness that it is to be a new england landscape um, those those the colorful fall foliage is unique to this region um, and a lot of that has to do with the plants that exist here um, a lot of native plants are incredibly beautiful. Um, most of my favorite plants uh, are, are happen to be native uh, because of their aesthetic value. Um, and then finally, they're adapted to our climate, our soil, our water, and our, eco our ecology. So what I'd like to do over the next several um, slides is um, show you some of my best lawn alternatives. So this is for the you know the early introduction to um, uh, to uh, converting from lawn to some type of uh, garden environment. Um, these are plants that are uh, relatively tough, uh, uh, relatively easy to establish. They're mat forming, uh, meaning that once they're established, they really help to keep weeds down. Um, and these are like low maintenance plants. Um, uh, and so these are these are things that you could really use as uh, lawn alternatives. In other words, um, if you have an area that's lawn now, you don't want uh, too much maintenance, you just want a green carpet, um, you want something that's sort of no nonsense, um, then you know these are the plants for you. Um, and because they're, they'll be very successful if they're planted in the right environment. Um, one of my favorites is wild strawberry. So this is Frigaria virginiana. Um, wild strawberry grows to about six to eight inches tall. Um, 
does very well in well-drained soils. It's, it's uh, tolerant of uh, drought and compaction, um, has uh, you know, beautiful little flowers in the spring that are followed by very, very tasty um, fruits. It works very well in combination with um, some of our warm season grasses. Difference between a warm season grass and a cool season grass is that warm season grasses are most active in the summer um, when, uh, when the temperatures are hot, when there's very little uh, moisture, and most of our native grasses happen to be warm season grasses. This is one of them. This is uh, Aragrasta spectabilis, the purple love grass. Um, if you've driven on a uh, highway in Massachusetts in July, you've probably seen that purple haze of, um, of uh, flowering grasses on the side of the road, and that's purple love grass. Um, it uh, gets about eight to 10 inches tall with the uh, flowering spikes, uh, but the grass itself is uh, maybe four to six inches tall, um, does well in full sun, well-drained soils, it's drought, salt, compaction tolerant, um, and it just has that beautiful purple flower um, over the summer. Um, and I, I happen to like these two in combination with each other. Um, and here's a picture of that wild strawberry fruit. They're very tasty in the middle of June. Um, both the plants in the previous slides are pretty aggressive uh, and um, they're plants that you uh, would plant in an area where you're not expecting to see a whole lot else grow. Um, and this plant, um, uh, alternatively is a much better behaved garden plant. Um, still a mat forming perennial will, you know, get a dense uh, um, uh, mat of evergreen, excuse me, not evergreen, but glossy foliage. Um, this is a deciduous plant, so it will uh, lose its, its leaves in the fall. Um, it gets to about six to eight inches tall. It's related to strawberry, um, sort of. Um, they're in the same plant family. Um, it has yellow flowers as opposed to the white, um, but that glossy uh, foliage really sticks around uh, all season long, and, and it's pretty bulletproof. Um, it's more of a, a clumping plant, so you need to plant more of it. It won't spread as much as the wild strawberry in the last image, um, but it really is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful garden plant. And here it is at the base of an of an oak tree. Um, probably the most traditional um, lawn alternative uh, in this in this presentation is Carex pennsylvanica, Pennsylvania sedge. Pennsylvania sedge is all the rage in the native in native plant circles um, because it is almost the perfect lawn alternative, uh, especially for dry shade. Um, this is a plant that can get six to eight inches tall, has a sort of mounding kind of moppy habit. Um, it's stoloniferous, which means it spreads um, through uh, just below the ground or just above ground um, uh, stems. Uh, it is a dense spreader. Um, it can be left unmowed. Um, this is a plant that's native or, or found naturally growing in like dry oak forests. Uh, that, um, and so it's very drought tolerant. Um, but we found, I found that uh, it can be mowed uh, once a year or so, um, uh, right around middle of June. Um, and that mowing will keep it looking a lot more like a traditional turf grass, um, but without the resource inputs, without the water, without the fertilizer, without the pesticides, um, without the need for mowing um, uh, straight through the summer. And it's just a great choice. Carex pennsylvanica, Pennsylvania sedge. Um, can't say enough great things about that as a, a fantastic lawn alternative. Um, Another warm season grass that gets uh, a little bit taller is um, little blue stem, Schizocarium uh, scoparium. Um, this, uh, this is one of my favorite warm season grasses. It's more of a clumper, but it does spread uh, quite a bit. Um, gets to be about two to four feet tall. Um, it can be mowed. I've actually seen applications where it's been mowed to a, a higher height of maybe eight inches or so um, to look a little bit more like a typical uh, turf grass, um, but I wouldn't do that. I'd like to let it grow. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't flop over like a lot of other ornamental grasses. Um, and again, this is another one you've definitely seen on uh, highway roadsides. Has great fall color. Um, turns kind of purplish, silvery before it eventually turns to a, a nice kind of rich brown um, for the winter. Um, and this is what you can expect to see in the winter time with um, little blue stem uh, around some uh, some snow. Um, uh, Gold star, Chrysogonum virginianum. This is one that's great for shade, great for a little bit of sun. Um, uh, takes moist to dry soils. It is rhizominous, and this plant's in the aster family. So if you recognize that flower, um, that is why. Uh, it 
starts blooming in the spring and pretty much blooms straight through the rest of the year, uh, rest of the uh, growing season. Um, and it does form a nice dense mat of, uh, of foliage um, and those beautiful yellow aster flowers uh, throughout the summer um, are just great. Um, this is my uh, absolute favorite plant in this presentation. This is um, Sebaldia tridentata, the three-tooth sincafoil. Um, here is a natural stand of it growing in, uh, in a crack in a, a field of granite. Um, this plant is tough as nails. It's an evergreen, uh, low shrub in the rose family. So it has flowers that look a little bit like an apple blossom. Um, the uh, foliage turns uh, kind of a purplish maroon in the fall and keeps that color straight through the winter. Um, it's drought tolerant, does really well in exposed harsh conditions, um, uh, uh, dry rocky soils, um, spreads uh, not aggressively, but spreads well. Um, and it's just a tough as nails plant. And I, I can't say enough great things about it. I, I love uh, three tooth sincafoil. I have it uh, planted at the top of my driveway. Um, and every single winter gets hammered with salt, um, doesn't skip a beat, really could care less about the salt, just has great color all through the winter and those, uh, those beautiful white flowers. Um, uh, uh, a New England native uh, here is wild ginger, uh, Sarum canadense. Um, this is a, a deciduous uh, ginger, unlike the European ginger that's evergreen. Um, here you can uh, see what the foliage looks like in the season. It is another dense forming uh, uh, or dense mat forming perennial, um, has very unique flowers. You can see those there in the bottom left corner of the, of the image. Um, the foliage is kind of blue green uh, and, and really striking, really beautiful. This is a plant that wants to be in average to moist soils um, and definitely wants to be in some shade. Uh, this is not a plant that's going to do well when exposed to too much sunlight. Um, this is running ground sole, sometimes called sneezeweed. Uh, this is a, a, a Pacara obvata. There's a, a, another plant called Pacara aurea um, that's very similar to it. Um, this takes uh, a full sun to, um, to some shade, wants moist uh, or kind of wettish uh, soils, um, although will tolerate some uh, droughty and, and uh, uh, drier poor soil conditions. It is a dense mat forming perennial, um, has beautiful yellow flowers uh, in spring, uh, early summer. Um, and then it's you know just a, a great foliage plant for the rest of the year. So very low to the ground, about maybe three to six inches tall, um, kind of purplish when the foliage first starts to come out in the uh, early part of the season. Um, just a great plant. Um, one, of, one of the best grasses uh, in our area is this uh, prairie drop seed, another warm season grass, Sporobolus heteroleptus. Uh, this gets about eight to 12 inches tall. Um, it's more of a mounding um, uh, grass. And this is one of my favorite applications of Sporobolus. This is at a garden in um, uh, Pennsylvania called Chanticleer. Um, and you can see the uh, Sporobolus lawn um, uh, that's, that's here in front of you. It just really beautiful, gets great fall color, turns kind of a burnt orange in the fall. Um, and uh, they actually maintain this by mowing it, or excuse me, by burning it um, maybe every other year. Uh, it is uh, fire dependent and, and very tolerant of fire. You don't have to do that at home. Um, you don't really have to mow Sporobolus unless you want to. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not suggesting that you burn it, um, but it is uh, it is a fabulous grass and really looks great as a, as a lawn alternative. Um, one that I would caution you against, uh, unless you have an area that you just absolutely don't wanna ever see any other plant grow again, um, is hay scented fern. Um, this plant gets about 12 to 18 inches tall, uh, really does well in moist, well-drained soils, although it's fairly drought tolerant as well. Um, it is a dense spreader, can colonize a large area. Uh, just be very careful uh, with it. And here you can see it, uh, it with some Carex pensylvanica in the foreground and, uh, and uh, hay scented fern in the background. Um, it is aggressive. Uh, so um, take that for what it's worth. Uh, if you want to see nothing but hay scented fern in an area, uh, then I suggest you plant it otherwise. Um, uh, shy away from it. Um, but an alternative fern is uh, Christmas fern, Polysticum acrostichoides, which is just a lot of fun to say. Um, this is a plant that does very well um, in well-drained soils, is moderately drought tolerant, um, has uh, it's kind of sort of evergreen foliage, um, looks really great in the winter, um, and, uh, and 
uh, if you plant a lot of it, it can really work well as a, as a dense lawn alternative. Um, and great to see that foliage up through the winter. Um, an anemone is uh, anemone canadensis. This is Canada windflower. Uh, another one that's uh, fairly aggressive and I uh, caution you uh, about planting it in a spot where you wanna see much else um, growing. Um, this plant does well in sun to shade, um, does well in moist, a little bit of dry. Um, uh, it's an aggressive spreader, has uh, great flowers uh, early, in the, early in the summer um, and, uh, and has some decent fall color as well. Uh, here's a little bit of a closer image of what those flowers look like. Um, just a couple more to get through here. This is Arctostaphylos uva ursi bearberry, another great name to say. Uh, this is another dense evergreen shrub um, with uh, 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 fruits that resemble a cranberry, um, has great winter interests. Uh, love the, uh, the color that you get on the foliage in the, in the winter. Um, needs to be planted in an area with well-drained soils. Um, that's the only characteristic this plant really can't uh, survive without. Um, it's gotta be in a well-drained uh, area. Um, but when it's happy and established, it is a dense thicket of evergreen foliage and a really fantastic lawn alternative for full sun. Um, Two more here, this is Phlox de Barricata. The wild blue phlox uh, are, are one of our native uh, woodland phloxes. Um, and you can see it here planted in conjunction with uh, foam flower, Tiarella cordifolia. Uh, fantastic combination between the two of these. These are definitely woodland perennials, want to be planted in some shade, uh, really want uh, well-drained soils with some uh, good organic matter. Um, but, uh, but a, a fantastic combination, really beautiful. And for a shady environment, um, you can't get much better than uh, that combination of, of, of flocks and Tiarella. Um, so uh, leave you with some parting thoughts here um, uh, with one of my favorite lawn images. Uh, American lawns are wasteful, environmentally damaging, uh, and just downright boring and sterile. They require excessive inputs of water, fertilizer, and pesticides, uh, not to mention the carbon impacts of uh, maintaining them. Um, there are myriad ways we can replace lawns in our landscapes. I've uh, given you just a, a, a handful of great native plants that work uh, as lawn alternatives. Um, our garden should contribute positively to environmental quality. Uh, and one easy way to do that is to kill your lawn. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that may have come up. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. Um, well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, that was really a lot to digest. And in fact, I know many others like myself may just watch the this again, in particular, the second half. Um, but we do have a number of questions. And I'm going to... Uh, Go to a few of these, uh, the more practical side of the house here. And one of them is um, you went through a long list. One can watch this again to write this all down. Uh, is there, uh, can one go to the Tower Hill and see these various plants and learn more about them there? Yeah, I would definitely recommend that for just about anything uh, that you're looking to try to do in your landscape. Um, if you're a vegetable gardener, um, if you, you know, if you have a lot of woodland uh, areas that you'd like to plan, if you've got, um, you know, if, if you want to see some of the latest and greatest annuals, or if you just want to see lawn alternatives, um, you know, if we, if we start to think about what we're expecting out of a lawn, um, it's a, it's a, a dense mat of foliage, uh, it's relatively, um, uh, easy to maintain, uh, and there are lots of great, you know, easy to maintain, dense mat forming perennials uh, that we can use in our landscapes as as good lawn alternatives. Um, but yeah, I mean, most botanic gardens have have uh, plant labels. Um, they have expert staff that can answer questions, um, and uh, great examples of plants that um, uh, that that you can try to introduce into your landscape. So I would definitely encourage a visit to a botanic garden, whether that's New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill or another botanic garden that might be closer to you. Um, it's just a great way to gain some inspiration and, and see some uh, fantastic examples of, of different plants and different applications. Two questions that often come up when thinking sure. about uh, transforming your lawn is, well, first of all, ticks. What do you do? Uh, is there going to be an explosion in the tick population when you do this? Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's one thing that I uh, 
don't really have a fantastic answer for. Um, ticks are a real problem, um, especially as the climate warms. Um, we have uh, fewer and fewer cold uh, days and fewer and fewer cold stretches through the winter. Um, ticks are better able to withstand those warmer temperatures. Um, they're active now. Um, it is uh, it is definitely a challenging uh, challenging question. Um, and you know, myself, uh, one of my horticulturists reported finding a tick on her yesterday. Um, it's just a constant. Um, Unfortunately, it's a constant uh, job hazard for those of us that work in the industry, something that we have to be really careful about. Um, always take precautions when you're uh, interacting in the natural world uh, or with the natural world uh, from you know, wearing long sleeves, uh, long pants. Um, I know a lot of people uh, um, go to great lengths to um, uh, you know, uh, use um, uh, uh, clothing that's been uh, treated with uh, tick deterrents um, and also you know, tucking your socks into your, uh, tucking your pants into your socks and those kinds of things. Um, the most important thing is to be diligent, to be uh, careful um, anytime you're outdoors. Uh, be careful to do, do tick checks and inspect yourself um, and also recognize that uh, no matter the environment, you're you're likely to find some ticks out there. And and number two, and there's ticks is, and you you did talk about this is invasives that you uh, you kill your lawn through one of the methods you you recommended, and then you get buckthorn and bittersweet and knotweed, and and you end up mowing again. Um, yep. So and you and you don't want to use herbicides or minimize their use. What's yep. your response to that? Yeah. So my my response to that is. Um, really, you know, be diligent and make sure that you're managing your landscape. Um, so it's why I was very cautious when I talked about mechanical removal of uh, turf grass um, to say that you've got to immediately, uh, once that sod is removed, um, come through and, and, uh, and put down a layer of mulch, put down some compost, um, start to rebuild the health of that soil. Um, Bare soil is just an invitation for uh, for weeds. Uh, it's an invitation for invasive species. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're managing your landscape. The best way to manage your landscape um, to prevent invasive species is to have a healthy plant community um, and to have a lot of plants. Uh, plants are the best competitors for um, invasive species, and you know don't allow them to grab a foothold. Um, uh, avoid bare soil, avoid bare mulch, and and really try to have a highly competitive. Uh, uh, garden so that you can avoid uh, having having those invasive species grab a foothold in your garden. And and uh, it said two uh, sure. questions that keep coming up with ticks and invasive species, but actually three. All and right. the third you also touched upon was um, you don't want to tick off, so to speak, your neighbors. You don't want to irritate your neighbors or have the homeowners association come after you. Uh, you had you said I believe you might mow a little apron around your lawn to sort of separate it from your neighbor's lawn. But your neighbor has the the uh, you know the typical lawn that you showed in some of your pictures, and you want to go a little bit wilder. Mm -hmm. Any particular plants or approach you would take to stay on good terms? <laughs> um, hopefully, you're a good baker. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that can, uh, I, I think good baked goods can, uh, help solve most neighborly problems. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. I, I live in a pretty typical suburban, um, uh, neighborhood and, you know, I know that my neighbor across the street who I'm very friendly with, um, hires a lawn service company. Um, and, uh, you know, he has a pristine, well manicured lawn that he's quite proud of, um, and I know that he curses me every time he sees the dandelions in bloom um, across the street because he's really concerned about them invading his uh, his territory. Um, but we're on good terms otherwise. Um, so I think um, you know one thing that's that, that I've always found is um, uh, it's it's not I, I I find it not worth getting into heated arguments about landscape with uh, the folks that you, uh, you know, are immediately surrounded by. Um, 
uh, it's t really tough to convince people um, that what they're doing is is wrong. Um, and sometimes those conversations uh, get rather uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I prefer not to have them. Uh, you know, I, I maintain my landscape the way I want to. He maintains his landscape the way he wants to. Um, and, uh, you know, I have concerns about the way he does it. He has concerns about the way I do it. And that's fine. We're neighbors. We're on good terms otherwise. But um, uh, yeah, it's 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 tricky. Um, I think the most important thing is to not 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 sweat it too much, uh, not be too concerned with uh, with uh, the 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 opinions of your neighbors. Um, do what you think is right, and uh, and because I'm I'm sure you're doing it right. Yeah, one neighbor had said that she was getting some sideways glances with her lawn as she let it go, neighbor, and then she put up a yeah. sign that said "Pollinator Pathway." Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's on, absolutely. And all the questions yeah. went away. <laughs> yeah, it's any any signal that you can send to folks that, hey, this is still a maintained landscape. I'm just maintaining it differently from the way that you expect. Um, mm -hmm. So whether it's mowing that edge around a, a meadow that you're uh, trying to maintain in your in your landscape, or it's putting up a pollinator pathway sign or a uh, backyard habitat sign or something like that. Yeah, there's all sorts of different ways to send that signal, um, uh, but try not to be adversarial about it. Yeah. Uh, two things we face here in Metro West, and I'm sure you do too, is deer and septic tanks. Uh, we have them both. And yep. is there anything, take septic tanks first, is there anything in particular one should be aware of when you have a septic tank in your backyard? Yeah, I have a septic tank at home. I just replaced my septic to the tune of, you know, more than $20,000 a couple of years ago. It's a, a costly investment, um, something that, you know, a lot of us really have to maintain. Um, I'm always really cautious when giving advice to people about what to maintain over there or what to plant over their septic, uh, their leach field, um, because I know how expensive it was to repair mine. And uh, I'd rather not... Um, uh, I'd rather not put people in a similar situation. Um, I think it's important to, um, uh, you know, not use woody plants over a septic field. Uh, it's really important to uh, stick with herbaceous plants. Um, if it happens to be in a shadier area, uh, that Carex Pennsylvanica is probably a, a ideal um, plant over a, a leach field. Um, it's not super deeply rooted. Um, it can be maintained uh, pretty well. Um, we'll do well without a whole lot of inputs from uh, from you, as I said before. Um, and uh, and if it's a sunnier environment, then something like purple lovegrass would be a really good option as well. Um, and uh, and aside from that, I I don't want to give a ton of uh, recommendations for septic uh, leach fields, just because I I'd hate to uh, have someone put a plant uh, on top of their leach field that I recommended that uh, it ended up causing problems. And a lot of our warm season grasses are very deeply rooted, um, so I'd I'd shy away from many of the warm season grasses uh, because of that. I just think you'd have too many too many issues with the leach field if you, if you uh, had warm season grasses above it. Mm -hmm. And then what about deer? Are there some plants that are better with deer than other? Yeah, so deer's Deer tastes change from uh, location to location. Um, at least that's uh, what I've discovered in my career. Um, sometimes plants that I would consider bulletproof in one area are, are favored by deer in other areas. Um, so I'm, I'm always cautious to say that something is deer proof. Um, I like to say that things are deer resistant. Um, Cornell University publishes a really great list of deer resistant plants um, and they have varying degrees on the list of um, uh, of relative resistance. So uh, plants that are, you know, low resistance, medium resistance, high resistance, or something like that. Um, most, um, uh, most garden centers uh, publish a good list of deer resistant plants, um, but a lot of it's trial and error. Uh, a lot of it is just, you know, try try one, see what happens. Like, for example, Solomon seal is a deer magnet. Um, if deer are a real problem in your garden, I would not suggest that you plant Solomon seal. Um, however, it works really well as an indicator that um, if you use a, um, a deer deterrent spray, um, which there are many of, things like liquid fence, for example, um, uh, if you have Solomon seal in your, seal in your garden and it's sprayed with that deer deterrent, um, you know, as soon as the deer start munching on it, that it's time to spray again. Um, and so that's just, you know, one recommendation that I would give is, is it's actually not a bad thing to have some, uh, some plants that the deer really favor, uh, because it can act as an indication that it's time to put out uh, that deer repellent uh, again. Um, so, okay. 
Yeah, there's a lot of uh, questions about uh, the list of plants and how could I get these and learn more. Now. So I'm giving you an opportunity here. This may be a good time to plug your book. Does it have sure. uh, this sort of information in there? It does. Yeah, it absolutely does. There's over 100 plants in the book. Uh, it's Native Plants for New England Gardens. Um, you can find it anywhere you, buy, you find books. Um, definitely in the gift shop at uh, um, uh, New England Botanic Garden. Um, uh, but you can, you can really buy it anywhere online. Um, it's a, a great place to find uh, Pretty, I think all of the plants that uh, that I spoke about tonight, um, and uh, a whole lot more. Um, and in the book, we we go through the cultural uh, requirements of uh, the various plants that we detail. Um, definitely talk about you know where they'll be successful, different landscape applications, um, and have some great images of each of the plants in the in the book as well. So, I look forward to finding it. Um, you know, and. and uh, Concerning this, you know, make your your uh, native garden look intentional. Uh, I think two recommendations. Uh, Maria says, "No mo may signs help neighbors understand what you're doing," and Jamie says, uh, "Put some rocks around it to make it really look intentional, and not just like sure. you're lazy and don't want to mow anymore." Yeah, I think I think anything that makes it look look intentional is is a uh, is is a good uh, is a good tip for sure. What do you think about cultivars? Someone has asked about, uh, you know, are, are, is it depend? Is it some cultivars are okay and others aren't? How do you know? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So um, so cultivars cultivars just short for cultivated variety. Um, a lot of the cultivars that we find uh, available at garden centers and nurseries are um, just selections of natural species. Um, so for example, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, mountain laurel, Calmia latifolia. There are a ton of cultivars of mountain laurel. Um, most of those are the result of you know simple genetic mutations or uh, breeding within that species, um, and they display different ornamental characteristics. Um, there are also cultivars that are the result of um, you know a lot more tinkering, a lot more breeding, crossing of uh, of uh, different species, not within a single species, um, and so there are a lot of different ways that cultivars arise. Um, many of them are just selections of uh, natural mutations here and there. Um, where um, where where you uh, where you get any concern about uh, cultivated variety is in terms of its uh, support of uh, like ecosystem services or its uh, relative um, support of uh, beneficial insects, um, pollinators, and the like. Um, and there's very little understood about this um, uh, so far. There's a woman named Annie White um, who conducted a really fantastic research trial uh, for her PhD at University of Vermont, um, where she was looking at um, uh, cultivated uh, varieties, so different cultivars and their um, uh, respective uh, natural species. And what she found was that um, really dependent on the species. So for example, uh, there's a plant called Culver's root um, and uh, typically has white flowers, um, but a selection with slightly pinkish flowers was more attractive to pollinators than the natural species. She, she counted a lot more pollinators on the, on the slight color variation than she did uh, on the white flowers. Um, alternatively, um, New England aster, um, there are a number of cultivars available of New England aster. Um, the natural species uh, was much more attractive to, uh, to pollinating insects uh, than the cultivated varieties that had different colored flowers. Um, so it's really species dependent. Um, it's a very new area of research. There's very little understood about it so far. Um, so I would say if it is something that you're concerned about, seek out Annie White's research because she's continued to do more of that uh, research. Um, seek out uh, Doug Tallamy and some of, some of his work. Um, pay attention to uh, Mount Cuba Center, which is a botanic garden in, uh, in Delaware um, that publishes research on this very subject, uh, on perennial species that they grow in their trial gardens. Um, and stay tuned because the jury's still out on, uh, on how much of an impact there is uh, here. Okay, good. Um, Barb asks about uh, what's the best time of year to uh, uh, transform your lawn into a more sort of native plant replacement. And if you could say more about the overseeding process, what's sure. how does that work? Yep. 
Yeah. So if, if your if your goal is to remove your lawn, um, it really depends on the strategy you're going to use to remove it. Um, so if you're going to use solarization, for example, that really needs to be done in the middle of summer uh, when the sun's at its highest point, when the sun's at its hottest, um, in order to take full advantage of the sun. Um, so in that case, you would be doing solarization over the summer and you do planting a new garden in the fall um, uh, because fall is a fantastic time for planting. Um, if you're doing any kind of mechanical removal, uh, frankly, you could really do that any time of the year that the ground's not frozen. Um, but in every case, I think it's important that you start to establish your new garden as quickly as you possibly can um, because bare soil leads to erosion, leads to degradation of uh, soil quality um, and, uh, and invites weed seeds. Um, so it really would depend on uh, the type of removal that you're doing and the type of landscape that you intend to plant. Um, spring is a great time for planting. Fall is a great time for planting. Uh, summer is a little bit more difficult to get plants established. So I try to avoid planting in the middle of summer. Okay. And then the overseeding? The, uh... Uh, oh, oh, sure. Yeah. So, um, so with overseeding, um, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, native seed that you might plant um, requires a chilling period. Um, and so you can overcome that chilling period uh, by, um, um, excuse me, I'm drawing a blank on the term. Um, you, can, you can buy vernalized seed um, that's already ready to go. Um, or you can just sow seed in the fall um, and expect that it will, it will germinate in the spring. Um, not, you know, it really depends on the species that you're working with, um, but I would highly suggest uh, seeding in the fall and expect those plants to germinate um, and start to grow in the following spring. Um, and uh, there's a, a great tool called a slit seeder um, that you can rent from a hardware store as well. Um, it's a fantastic way to get seed down into the soil um, in and among uh, an existing lawn. Um, so if, if your goal is just to add some diversity to a lawn, uh, rent a slit seeder, um, purchase some seed, um, and sow that seed probably in, in, uh, in early fall. Okay. Boy, there are so many questions. I think we could be here to midnight, but I'm just going to go. Uh, there are really a pouring in. Just... Um, maybe two more uh all right sounds good talking about their particular issues they have but one i think that many people may face especially in the last year or two is flooding or very wet soil yeah. and what are your recommendations there yeah i don't have a great recommendation there and the and reason being because um the climate's changed so much uh that in the last few years we've gone from feast or famine every single year it's either a you know historic drought historic flooding. Um, we've, you know, so far this year, we've had probably 15 to 18 inches of precipitation rainfall um, in, uh, in, in uh, central Massachusetts, which is probably twice uh, what we should expect to see uh, so far. Soils are oftentimes waterlogged. Um, and, uh, you know, the best thing you can do is um, deal with uh, stormwater on your particular property. So uh, install a rain garden, um, you know, divert your uh, your downspouts to that rain garden um, to try to minimize the impact on the rest of your garden. Um, and, you know, expect that you're going to see some plant losses um, because unfortunately, um, when we swing from, you know, drought uh, lasting for weeks, if not months in one season, and then, uh, you know, uh, Noah's Ark in the following season, uh, there's really, there, there are very few plants that can withstand that long term. Um, so, um, it's it's a really difficult one. Right. That's a really difficult one to answer. And we're losing plants constantly because of the wild swings and in, in, uh, precipitation. Okay. Um, so maybe a good question to end up with is what sure. is your recommendation uh, as a source of native native plants? Uh, where can oh, one sure. buy these things? Well, so you're in the Metro West and um, uh, uh, the nursery at Garden in the Woods in Framingham has a tremendous selection of native plants. They uh, specialize in New England natives, so plants that are really uh, native to the eco-regions of New England. Um, most garden centers now will have a native plant section. Um, uh, and, you know, but the other thing is to do your research because oftentimes uh, you visit a garden center and you see a great plant. Um, you may not recognize that it's native. Uh, so, you know, know what you're looking for. Um, 
grab the book, uh, read through it ahead of time, uh, bring it with you when you when you go plant shopping, um, and look for those species that you find really uh, really attractive um, to you. Um, so know what you're looking for. Um, look to local resources like Garden in the Woods. Uh, Lots of local nurseries have native plant sections, but also um, uh, just because they don't call it out as a native plant doesn't mean it isn't. So, um, uh, you know, know what, you're, know what you're looking for before you shop. Okay. Well, I want to uh, sincerely thank you for joining us this evening. And I particularly appreciated your sort of honesty and, and uh, saying, you know, this sometimes this is difficult and it, you may have to work on it, you may lose some plants. It's, it's uh, refreshing to hear that it's worth it. But uh, you know, it's it's not just getting a a pile of uh, meadow seeds and throwing it across your lawn and coming yep. back next year. Takes some um, effort. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I hope we are all inspired to do a little less mowing and a little more planting in our yards going forward. Uh, I think it will be healthy for our environment and maybe also healthy for us at the same time. Uh, and we should spread the word to our neighbors and our communities. You know, it's not only our own backyards, but we deal with a lot of institutions and town buildings and schools, et cetera, that also have a lot of lawns and maybe could reconsider sure. at least part of what they what they mow. So remember to sign up to our email list. Uh, you can go to MetroWestClimateSolutions.org and get on the list and you'll be notified of all upcoming sessions. So I want to say happy uh, planting, everybody. Uh, any final message you want to say before you sign off, Mark? No, this was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the great questions and uh, happy gardening. Spring's here. Yes. Can't wait to get out. Thank you Thank all you. and good night. Thanks very much.